Um, so continuing with the uh, well, was for some of review of uh, just for solving a single nonlinear equation. It's at stage four. Next class, we'll talk about solving a system of uh, nonlinear equations. Uh, so last time we we'll talked about the fixed point iteration, uh, and today the focus will shift to uh, Newton's method. Um, just a quick recap uh, that we have um, the Reiner equation f of x equals zero in the form x equals p of x. That we can have this simple iteration uh, where each new iterate comes from plugging the previous iterate into your function g that hopefully converges. And then we have uh, a solution guaranteed to exist if a function g maps a given interval a b into itself. That means that there is a solution uh, in that interval. Uh, we have this condition for uniqueness of a solution that is the derivative that's sufficient for uniqueness. That is, uh, after by the derivative is uh, bounded by a constant less than one um, on interval. And then uh, if this condition is satisfied, not only is the solution unique, but fixed point iteration for any initial guess in this interval, which the condition holds. Uh, that that iteration is guaranteed to convert. Um, now, I talked some last time about uh, relaxation. Um, so I want to go a little more detail on that, but hopefully not so much detail that I give away stuff from homework. Um, but I actually had to edit this a bit from last time. Um, so, the, so on the path to Newton's method, we have our original equation we'll solve f of x equals zero. We write the equation in this form g of x is x minus some non zero constant lambda times f of x, uh, so that this equation is equivalent uh, to this one. Um, and uh, lambda is called the realization parameter, and we want to make convergence, we we'll to try to ensure convergence and also try to get convergence to be as rapid as possible. Um, and what I showed you last time, when I did a Taylor expansion of g of x around the uh, solution x star, is that convergence is faster if the absolute value of the derivative is smaller. Okay, so, that, that, so that's our goal, to make that as small as possible. So we make an assumption that f prime at the root is uh, positive. Uh, we also assume that the derivative is uh, continuous at the root. Um, so, um, by continuity, if a function is uh, positive at a point and continuous, then for at least some interval around that point, uh, such that the uh, function, in this case f prime, is also positive. Um, so, so, the positivity at this point and continuity guarantee us that f prime is positive on this interval that I'll call capital I. So it's an interval that is centered at the root and has this radius uh, delta. Now delta might be incredibly small. We don't know what delta is. But the point for now is that this delta actually exists. Right. Um, now, this interval is a closed interval. Um, and it is a uh, bounded interval, bounded set. Therefore, it is compact. Uh, yes, I love to make real house references. Yeah, but well, actually, this it, it's it's fun to refer to other areas of mathematics. It all makes us together. Um, so, a continuous function on a compact set, in this case, the closed interval, has a minimum and maximum. So we know that. Uh, on this interval, f prime is uh, bounded below by little m and bounded above by capital M. Um, and we already know that on this interval, f prime is positive, so these bounds are uh, also positive. So we want to use these upper bounds on prime to find lower upper bounds for g prime <coughs> on this interval. Um, and then from there, find some value, capital L, Lipschitz constant, 
uh, plus or equal to one. Um, oh, that could be strictly less than one. Such as d prime is less than equal to l. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that part of it. So, this exploration that's been assigned, 10.3.9, is where you work out the details on that, where you can actually find the expression where l also just finds upper bounds of d prime based on these upper bounds for f prime. Because um, f and g have a simple relationship, uh, so that the knowing something about f prime will lead to knowing something about g prime. Um, Okay, but you still have to make sure that there is a fixed point. So if I choose some x value that's in this interval capital I, I need to be sure that g of x is also in this interval. Uh, so there's a guaranteed existence of a fixed point. And uh, if that can be established, then we have also guaranteed uniqueness, also a, a convergence of fixed point iteration for any initial guess in the interval. So working out uh, that, um, X in this interval implies G of X is also an interval. That's a, the following exploration, 10, 3, 10. So, so these two problems, you know, where you work through the details of showing that uh, uh, convergence can be guaranteed, at least for an initial guess, that is uh, sufficient to solve. Um, so once all these conditions are settled, that uh, you know the G uh, maps this interval capital I into itself, that these conditions are satisfied, then fixed point iteration is guaranteed to converge for any initial guess in here. So all the assumptions of that fixed point theorem are satisfied. So these are problems right here. Um, okay, now I can't say too much at this point because in this problem is where you actually work out the expression for uh, uh, for the, like the optimal lambda uh, that, that guarantees uh, convergence. Um, now it can be shown. Well, once you have that expression, um, I'm not playing on my phone. I'm looking up uh, previous notes from uh, last Wednesday's class. I'm not sure how much I revealed over right there. Um, anyway, now, um, the, uh, for the intermediate value there, um, it's possible to show once you have an expression for, uh, lambda, that lambda is actually equal to one over f prime of c for some c in this uh, interval, this interval capital I. Um, so now this is what uh, this fixed point iteration looks like. Now uh, we don't know what c is. We only know, uh, well, actually, we know c is in this interval, but we don't know what the interval is here. Uh, 
but, um, but the fact that we do know that it's we have x minus f of x over f prime at some point. Um, what we can do is actually use 1 over f prime at the latest iterate. So in other words, we can vary lambda from iteration to iteration. So what we're really doing is we're, we're, if, we, if we modify this iteration, get this one, um, then uh, you know, convergence, and this convergence is happening, uh, x k is converging to a root. Um, we can uh, let the interval i uh, shrink. And what happens in that case is it actually causes L to go to zero. Uh, this lift shift constant. Because um, remember, capital L is upper bounds for derivative. If L is going to zero, the derivative is going to zero. That means convergence is getting faster and faster. Uh, so, uh, which, which is what we want. So we actually get quadratic convergence in this case. And so this method, so this modification of this fixed point iteration that's called relaxation um, is Newton's method. So you can think of Newton's method as a way to um, Choose uh, perform fixed point iteration with a optimal uh, relaxation parameter that's allowed to vary from iteration to iteration. Um, so, questions about uh, having your fixed point? So at least you have some breadcrumbs for future problems. Well, maybe put up too many breadcrumbs, but okay. Um, okay. Now, um, I'm going to show why fixed point iteration is quadratic in this one case. Um, so I'm going to assume that the derivative root is non-zero. Because as I mentioned before, when a derivative when f of x starts zero and f prime of x starts zero, that's a badly conditioned root finding problem, um, which is worth looking into, but we're not, we're not going to assume that now. So if we perform fixed point iteration with this g, x minus f over f prime, then I go ahead and compute the derivative. And uh, after simplifying, uh, we wind up with this. But then if we substitute x equal to x star, well, f of x star is zero. And we're assuming that f prime and x star is non-zero. So g prime at the root turns out to be zero. So then, repeating the Taylor expansion that I performed last time, we have new iterate minus x star is equal to g of old iterate minus g of x star, because x star equals g of x star is root. And then Taylor expansion gives these are the first two terms from the Taylor expansion of that. But since g prime and x star is zero, this term goes away. Um, so now what we have is the error after k plus one iterations is equal to this. It's uh, the one half g double prime at an unknown point that's between x star and x k times the previous error squared. So whenever you have new error is uh, proportional to previous error squared, that's what quadratic convergence means. Um, so the error is going to zero very rapidly. Um, oh, the constant in front, oh, I goofed here. I need to take absolute value. So the asymptotic error constant is a constant of proportionality. And it has to be non negative. All right. Um, so that's how. So the fixed point iteration generally is only linearly convergent, that we have this uh, leading error term right here, set this 
specially constructed G passes this part to become zero, which leads to quadratic. So that's one way to arrive at Newton's method. Uh, the other way, um, which really is simpler, um, I guess less intellectually satisfying, uh, is if you approximate your function f of x at some, at your, your latest iterate, xk, by the tangent line to f at that point, then the new iterate it's just the x-intercept of that tangent line. Um, and uh, so by working out what the x-intercept is, and saying like, okay, xk plus one is the x-intercept of the tangent line of f at xk, what you end up with is exactly this iteration. So it's, it's, it's equivalent. Um, so the idea is, um, as, you, as xk gets closer and closer to the root, um, the function is more accurately approximated near uh, that iterate uh, by a tangent line. So the x intercept of the tangent line will be a better, better approximation of the uh, x intercept of f of x itself. Now, if I analyze the convergence of Newton's method directly, Form Taylor expansion of uh, of f, then I get this result that um, so now we're not doing fixed point iteration anymore. That the new error is roughly the um, this scaling factor f double prime over two f prime times the previous error squared. So again, quadratic convergence. Um, so. This factor right here is equivalent to the one half g double prime uh, factor that I showed you earlier. Uh, so that's so this is the asymptotic error constant. Um, but only valid if f prime at the root is non-zero, which is what we have been assuming. Um, if it is zero, in other words, if uh, f has a uh, root that's it's not a simple root, or like if it's a double root. Uh, then the convergence slows down to uh, linear. Uh, so the, the method can still converge, it's just slow. And uh, so I have an example in the text where I have this function. Uh, we have x minus 1 squared times e to the x. So this function has a double root at x equals 1. So f is 0 there, f prime is also 0 there. Um, and it's worked out in this example that uh, I'm going to do. Uh, convergence is linear, and the asymptotic error constant is equal to one half. Um, so, more generally, suppose your function has a root at x star, and the multiplicity, which I'll call little m, is greater than one. Um, so uh, that means that uh, the function is zero there, uh, the derivatives up to order m minus one. Are also zero at the root. So um, that would mean that you could write f of x this way as x minus x star to the nth power times some other function g that's non zero uh, at the root. So what happens if I apply this uh, Newton's method to this function? So what do we expect for convergence behavior in that case? So I go ahead and substitute. So here I have, well, so what I'm doing is I'm taking Newton's method as written here, and then I'm substituting that form of f of x into this, and you know, carrying out the differentiation, and seeing what I get. I have x equals 1, equals xk minus f of xk. And then down below, I have a uh, product rule for uh, f prime of xk. And notice we have these factors, xk minus x star, raised to some power. Well, there could be a lot of cancellation there. Uh, so once I simplify, then uh, this is what I have. And then what I do is. 
Um, so this is what Newton's method produces. But now I'm going to subtract x star from both sides because I want the error. So on the left side will have the error after k plus one iterations, and then the right side will have the error after k iterations times sign. Um, okay, so I subtract x star from this side. So now I have xk minus x star, but I also have xk minus x star up here. So I have this common factor. So now I can factor that out, and I'm left with this. Um, but xk is converging to x star. So if my iterates continue, this part in the denominator is going to zero. So what's left is, the, uh, so um, as k goes to infinity, this factor that is multiplying xk minus x star converges to this, one minus one over m. Um, so I mentioned earlier, in um, this example in text, um, this function has a double root at x equals one. So the multiplicity is equal to two, and little m is equal to two. And in this example, it showed directly that the um, asymptotic error constant is one half. And sure enough, if I plug in n equal two in here, that is what I get, it's one half. Um, and um, so, but the, the, the multiplicity to the extent to which uh, x star is a root of f and its derivatives that determines what the scaling factor is. But uh, regardless of that scaling factor, the point is if, if you have a multiple root at x star, the convergence is only linear. So it's drastically slowed down. Uh, questions about the multiple root case. One thing you want to mention, but I want to make sure it's not already in the house. Oh, it's not. Okay. One point I want to make is a way around this. Well, it's still in business method. Um, with a multiple root. So if you have reason to believe that your root is multiple roots. Multiple. Okay. Um. Oh. Can't touch there. Um. What you can do is apply Newton's method to this function. Well, sine of x is equal to f of x over f prime of x. Um, so if f, if f starts a multiple root of f, uh, that by divided by f prime, Um, so if f has a multiple root of x star, by trying to derive that uh, um, excessive power of x minus x star is canceled out. Um, so now Newton's method will converge quadratically on this function. Um, but uh, there is one drawback. If I were to you get a Apply Newton's method to any function, even to compute derivative. That's one of the drawbacks to Newton's method that requires derivative. Well, now if I want the derivative of this function, 
since it already involves the derivative of the cap, um, I will, the technical quotient rule on psi will involve f double prime. Um, okay, um, so, uh, so there's definitely a trade off there, a more computational expense. Now, so that's one issue of Newton's method that doesn't do well with uh, multiple groups. Um, if you have uh, uh, another issue of Newton's method is the judicial guess to be close, or the iteration might not converge at all. Um, and this is my favorite example involving Newton's method that I guess was said last semester. You apply it to this function, f is equal to a constant a minus 1 over x. So you work out what a derivative is. Derivative is just, is just 1 over x squared. So you work out what the Newton's iteration is. That can be simplified as much as you can. You end up with this. Um, x equals 1 is equal to this formula involving xk. Now, for root, if you just set this equal to 0, the root is 1 over a. So in other words, it's a way to compute the reciprocal of a number without performing any divisions. Uh, and this was actually used in the old IBM computer in the 60s to implement division in hardware. There was no division circuit. It's just uh, used the, the circuits for um, multiplication and subtraction um, and, and this iteration. And uh, it was pretty effective. Um, so, but there's a condition that the uh, criteria that in order for this iteration to converge, you need uh, your initial guess to satisfy this condition. So it should already be in the ballpark. Okay, so on one hand, uh, much more rapid convergence than uh, uh, fixed point iteration normally would be, um, but it's less reliable. Um, and you need to do this, I guess. Um, and then there's a drawback of, uh, of all of the, the, the methods that I covered last semester for finding uh, solutions not an equation. The only one that requires computing the derivative of the function you're trying to find the root of is Newton's method. Um, so that can have substantial computational expense. Uh, that might partially offset what you mean from uh, getting faster convergence. So a way around that is the secant method. So if you replace, so instead of dividing by the derivative, Instead, you use this difference quotient to approximate a derivative at xk. Uh, so here we have like a backward uh, difference formula. Uh, then we have uh, this is called the secant method. So instead of approximating f by tangent line xk, you approximate f by secant line um, based on points xk and xk minus 1. So each iterate depends on the previous two this time. So now we can use the x of that secant line. And as the iterates are converging, these points are getting closer and closer together. So that secant line is actually converging to a tangent line as your iteration proceeds. Uh, but because you don't have to evaluate the derivative at any point, um, and you only have to evaluate f, only, you only need one new evaluation of that every iteration. So each iteration costs less than uh, Newton's uh, to perform. Um, so the, the um, there is a small loss of convergence speed. So whereas Newton's method converges quadratically, the order of convergence is two. The um, convergence secant method is called super linear. Uh, so the order is between one and two. So Iterate after k plus one iterations is uh, proportional to here after k iterations raised to a rather unusual unusual power p. P is uh, one plus the square root of five over two is so roughly one point six one eight. That number is, you may know is a golden ratio. Um, so it's still quite rapid diverge. It's still much better than linear. Uh, not so quadratic, but a lot of people end up using CK method instead of Newton's method because what they gain in efficiency from not having to evaluate f prime can actually uh, more of an offset the loss 
of, of computational efficiency from having to perform more iterations due to diverging super linearly instead of quadratically. Um, because in both cases, you're not needing many iterations to converge anyway. Um, so maybe performing one or two iterations less is uh, perfectly fine. Uh, or so sorry, one or two iterations more is perfectly fine if those iterations are not expensive to perform. Um, now, um, now everything I've been showing you is about solving a single nonlinear equation of f x equals zero, or f is a scalar value function of one variable. But well, what's going to become relevant to us for um, so, uh, methods, methods for solving um, uh, uh, systems of uh, uh, ordinary differential equations, or we take a boundary value problem for ODE and discretize it, and uh, it gives us a system of nonlinear equations. So we want to be able to solve systems of nonlinear equations. So that means that whatever methods we have for a single nonlinear equation need to be generalized. Um, so fixed point iteration and Newton's method do generalize to systems in a fairly straightforward manner. Um, secant method, yes, it does technically generalize, but this is less straightforward to, to, to make it happen. Um, and I'm not really going to get into that very much uh, in, in this class. Um, with, uh, there's some, well, some comments on it in, in, in the text, but um, we're going to be looking at the first section of chapter 11, where we talk about the root finding methods for uh, systems of equations. And then we'll have all the preparation we need to get into uh, numerical methods for differential, for, for ODEs. And that's what will be the remainder of the semester. Uh, both initial value problems and uh, value value problems. Okay. Um, I don't get it. Oops. I don't get it. Oops. We're only halfway from the class period. Um, oops. <laughs> Um, right. So, um, oh, you guys better publish this whole assignment now that I just covered the session off. Um, As far as homework is concerned, um, okay, so for this section, writing a function that implements Newton's method for given f and f prime. Um, okay, how many correct decimal places? Um, so that's the order of Newton's method. Uh, it's basically observing the kind of convergence you expect it to achieve. Those problems were assigned last semester, but there were some that weren't. Yeah, problems five and six were not. Okay, um, so this example I mentioned earlier, my new method with this function. So what's shown in this example is that with this specific function, uh, you get uh, the new error is equal to the old error times this factor, xk over xk plus 1. xk is converging to 1, so we end up being, uh, getting a new error in limit is equal to the old error times a factor that's converging to 1 half. This exploration is about proving that what happened in this example for a specific f of x actually happens in general for uh, so for any function that satisfies these assumptions, f and f prime equal to zero and x star, but f double prime is non-zero, um, show that you get the linear convergence with a scaling factor of one half. Um, okay.
Um, what I'd like to do for this problem, though, is, uh, okay, earlier this section is a convergence analysis for Newton's method in a general case where f prime at the root is non-zero, and we get the quadratic convergence in this case. Um, so what I'd like you to do I want you to show this without using the assumption I made here in the notes. Uh, in the notes, make an assumption that f is equal to this factor times g. Um, and um, I want you to show this just working with f and using this information about derivatives and Taylor expansion. I want you to show me that. You can go through both that that kind of process for converting cell and arrive at one half. Um, but since you have this information about the uh, derivatives, you know it, it makes sense to if you can do a Taylor expansion that it could be around x star. Um, Okay, um, this exploration is a theoretical one. Um, who better quadratic convergence when f prime is positive and f double prime is negative? Uh, so increasing and concave down on an interval that contains the root and initial guess. Now, the idea for this exploration is you uh, follow what's done in this example. Well, it's not in this, this discussion right here. So it's done in this case, as I mentioned, in normal derivatives method, you want to have initial gas close to the root, or the method might first. But in certain cases, like here we have f prime and f double prime positive. So here it's increasing and concave up. So it's shown in this case that if you're on, if you, um, uh, Choose initial guess in this interval where the, the width delta could potentially be large. So, this is a situation where it's possible to choose initial guess far away from the root and still have quadratic convergence. Um, so, if you go through this in the case where f prime and f double prime are both positive, the idea behind this exploration is to adapt this to the case where f double prime is now negative. So, uh, so just to figure out what is it that needs to change from this um, for everything to be valid. So it's almost like I've written a blueprint for your proof right here. You just gotta make sure that you get the particulars right. Um, okay, then um, that about function for secant method, and then about uh, examining the convergence of this example right here. Okay, so two coding problems, two simple convergence expect inspections, you know, problems uh, four and eight, and then two solution problems. Okay. Questions about any of that? Well, I guess it's a lunch hour then. Mm -hmm.